Very good morning to all of you. Honorable President of Estonia, Speaker of Parliament, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I hope uh, the last night was something what uh, gave us a very good mood for uh, today and tomorrow to, uh, to start with our conference. First, um, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Marko Mikkelsen. And I am a chairman of uh, Foreign uh, Relations Committee of Parliament of Estonia. And it is my privilege and uh, great pleasure to warmly welcome you all in Tallinn and to hereby open the Interparliamentary Conference for the Common Foreign and Security Policy and Common Security and Defence Policy. Once again, I hope that those of you who were able to attend uh, a dinner last night at the Kumu Art Museum, enjoyed it. I also hope that you have uh, well received our presidency presents, including uh, the sleeping masks. Actually, four different uh, uh, animal masks were gifted at um, random. And you are all kindly welcome to exchange the one uh, you received with that of your neighbors. Um, if you think a fox or an owl uh, suits you better. We did it last night. <laughs> but back to business. I have been uh, participating in uh, these conferences since 2003. At first, they were small and informal, meant only for chairmen of a Foreign Affairs Committees, thus also um, losing a, uh, but they became a bigger and grow and, um, but also, I suppose also losing a bit of uh, initial atmosphere. But to me, sharing views with colleagues uh, from all over Europe and uh, discussing relevant issues that influence us all has always been uh, important. That's why our focal uh, point uh, while organizing this uh, conference and in consulting with our colleagues uh, from many national parliaments and uh, from European Parliament was to have the topics that matter and the speakers that have the knowledge. And we are all lucky or challenged, if you like, uh, to live in a time of change that makes the issues of foreign security and defense policy as interlinked and topical as ever. There are numerous challenges when looking within and beyond the European Union. There are issues like migration that need a long-term perspective, joint decision and actions. There are issues like the ongoing Russian aggression in Ukraine that need common understanding and common position. There are issues that are happening right now and need our attention, like the ongoing large-scale military exercise just behind our border or North Korea's provocative behavior. And what about China, who challenges us in many ways? This is no news that the world is bigger and no country can face the challenges and solve the problems on its own. Within our own borders, uh, we face challenges of another kind, the direction of the uh, European Union is a topic of debate, and we do not know the exact outcome of Brexit. Every country has its own internal issues, and when elec elections approach, the wider picture sometimes tends to lose its importance. As a recent survey shows, most citizens of the European Union are not happy with the current direction of the European Union, but would still vote to remain in the bloc. Our unity is based on values, and then values tie us together. As you can see from our program, we are going to have very intense and hopefully very interesting two days. The four sessions today will focus on uh, why Europe matters, invigorating uh, the unity of the West, and transatlantic relations, 
the European Union's priorities in the area of CFSP and CSDP and state of play beyond the EU borders. Tomorrow's sessions will explore ways to strengthen European defence and practical aspects of hybrid world. We have asked uh, a great number of distinguished guests uh, to be the speakers at our conference to make it as exciting and thought-provoking as possible. We also want to have lively debates and dynamic discussions. The conference is live streamed and to make the event even more spirited, you are most welcome to share your ideas on Twitter by using the hashtag ParleU2017EE, which is shown on the slides behind me. And now, dear colleagues, without any further ado, I'm uh, delighted to give the uh, floor to the president of Rigo, Mr. Eki Nestor, who would like to welcome you here on behalf of our parliament. Mr. Nestor, by the way, is the longest serving member of Rigigogo in the history of Republic of Estonia. Twice he has held the post of minister. He was minister of regional affairs and minister of social affairs. He is a member of Social Democratic Party, but what is also very important to bear in mind, Eki is known as the most famous former hippie and DJ of our parliament. Mr. Nestor, floor is yours. Thank you, and President Kaljulaid, dear colleagues. I'm delighted to greet all of you here in Tallinn. Something that I really appreciate about the EU is, is its ability to bring people of Europe together, encourage countries to open up and engage a cross-border communication, not as inconvenient obligation, but as the norm. There is a tremendous value in discussing important issues and meeting face to face. And even in e Estonia, the internet will never replace human contact. Whenever I meet my colleagues in the European Union, I feel like I'm meeting with old friends. And I'm sure it's the same with you. To be honest, the European Union does not always work perfectly. Running the largest single market in the world is by default a difficult task. And so is reconciling the opinions and interests of 28 member states, big and small, from Mediterranean to the Baltic Sea. Many of your home countries have been independent for centuries, but several EU members still celebrate their birthdays in double di digits. The 99-year-old Republic of Estonia has only half a year left during which we, as a state, can be cheeky youngsters. Soon we will be respectable of a respectable age, expected to act in a more grown and more digni dignified manner. While I can promise that we will continue to respect and defend our common values and will follow through our promises, I can also assure you that we will not lose our youthful and inquisitive spirit our openness and readiness to improve and grow. Not just internally, but also as a member of the EU, be it in the context of creating digital single market or contributing to the innovation and cooperation in EU defence industry. Dear friends, you are in the country that has known from the beginning that in order to survive and prosper, it has to integrate, then to integrate and then to integrate again. Geographical realities cannot be changed, and cooperating with free, democratic, and open countries in Europe and beyond is Estonia's life insurance. From the national security perspective, our membership in NATO and EU is critically important. Let me give you a very visible example. It is with the help of you our friends in Europe and North America, the Baltic airspace is safeguarded. The Baltic air policing mission is powerful expression of the unity of our alliance and the effectiveness of pooling 
of resources. These highly effective and already operational frameworks, the cooperation between EU and NATO must be further strengthened and expanded. We must not forget the military operations and civilian missions that take place away from the territory of the European Union, but contribute to our security in very direct way. Right as we speak, there are more than 5,000 men and women employed in missions from Ukraine to Central African Republic. Under the flag of the EU, they are on the front lines to keep peace, prevent conflicts and support the rule of law, so that we could be more secure. Dear colleagues, as grown-ups, we know how to reserve, to be reserved and polite. But children are sincere and open in their answers. Thinking about security and safety reminds me in conversation with the third graders from the Estonian island of Hiu. A 10-year-old girl was asked what she liked in Estonia. And she answered, Estonia is a beautiful country and there may never be war ag here again. I'm not afraid of it. This was a moment for me, writ to the retired hippie, uh, when I felt that something had been done right. What could be more gratifying than knowing that the generations that were born and raised in free Estonia are not afraid? It's, it is not that there are less streets, quite the opposite, but there is a profound confidence that when Estonia works together with its friends and allies, there is nothing that can break our bond and our union. Freedom can never be taken for granted. We have to work together, have confidence in our values and our way of life, and do all it takes to protect them. I wish you fruitful discussions and much success in the important work that you do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nestor. And now uh, I have a, a great pleasure to invite uh, to for opening remarks also one of the co-chairs of this conference. Uh, you already recognized from the photo, David McAllister, Chairman of uh, Foreign Affairs Committee of European Parliament. Please, David. Madam President, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, on behalf of us all, I would like to thank our Estonian hosts for their warm welcome yesterday evening and their cooperation in preparing this conference. Especially, of course, I would like to thank Michael Mikkelsen, but the Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee here in Estonia, but also Mr. Hannes Hanzo, who chairs the National Defence Committee. I would like to thank you, and of course, all members of your team, I think this has been a very well-prepared conference and we're really looking forward to two interesting days here in Tallinn. Dear colleagues, on behalf of the European Parliament's representation, I would like to say that we, it is a great pleasure for us to see you all today. Thank you for being here in Estonia for two days of intense discussions and indeed we have a particularly full program. A lot of us were in Malta a few months ago and I guess we all remember that at that time, we mostly focused on the European Union's immediate neighborhood. This week, we will prioritize wider global issues whilst addressing the Balkans and relations with Russia during tomorrow's morning seminars. Our discussions are particularly timely given the worrying developments that are increasing, notably this week in the Korean Peninsula. This was also one of the main topics when not even the main topic at the Foreign Affairs, Minister, Foreign Affairs Minister Council yesterday here in Tallinn. In addition, the level of trust we can have in the new US administration is being put to the test, not only in relation to the North Korean threat, but also when it comes to our relations with key players such as Russia and China, and in terms of tackling challenges multilaterally notably climate change. In this context, I would like us to reflect upon the European Union as a global actor and about 
our responsibility that results from this aspiration, but also about the nature of our multipolar world and about the rules that shape the global order today. I personally believe the ongoing shift in the global balance of powers requires the EU member states to act more as a collective on the world stage. The multilateral system can no longer rely on top-down solution, solutions for global problems. The European Union has the potential to become a front-runner by providing a vision and a new impetus for a reformed system of global governance that includes old but also new institutions. In order to do so, the European Union needs to develop a new way of thinking about its role in the world and the role of international organizations in general. An effective multilateral and multidimensional diplomacy is the only way to strike a balance between the EU's fundamental values and global security. A final remark, our citizens are worried. Many of our citizens are worried when observing world events, both close to the EU's borders and further afield. We therefore need a profound discussion on what kind of Europe we all want to live in today and in the future. I have always believed that there is no and there shouldn't be any kind of fortress Europe. And I fear that emotional rhetoric concerning those that flee to Europe impacts on our unity and solidarity. But still, if the EU shouldn't be a fortress, it should equip itself adequately to be in a position to tackle raising threats, including in terms of cyber and information warfare. This will be, as we heard, also a topic of our last session tomorrow. In the meantime, I look forward to all the other debates we are about to hold during this conference. Once again, I take the opportunity to underline the importance for us as parliamentarians to actively engage in our debate on the security and defense, both at European and national levels. Thank you very much. I wish us an excellent conference. And once again, the Estonians, you've been great hosts. Let's have a really good summit. Thank you. David. See you later. Thank you. <coughs> And now, without uh, further delay, I would like to invite uh, my very good colleague, uh, Head of National Defence Committee of Estonian Parliament, my good friend, Hannes Hansa, to take a lead uh, for our n first session. Hannes, please. Uh, well, thank you, Marco, for uh, opening the uh, conference. I do hope also, on my behalf, that everybody enjoyed the dinner and the music uh, last night. But now we are pretty much ready after the opening remarks to hit on to the discussion stage. And as you know, that we have prepared a conference where we put a lot of focus on debate, questions, answers, and, uh, and discussions. And I'm really, really honored and privileged to invite to the floor Her Excellency, the President of the Republic of Estonia, Madame Kersti Kaljulait. Please, big round of applause. Please, to make yourself comfortable. Uh, and uh, to accompany the president, there will be a vice president of the European Investment Bank, Alexander Stubb, please. Please, just make yourself comfortable. Now, before we start, uh, I do have the obligation and duty to uh, start on the administ administrative uh, remarks. Uh, please listen very carefully so we don't need to repeat them many times. We will if we have to. Um, and bear with me. Uh, the seating at this conference is prearranged, and it is very important that you use the one, the seat that we have reserved for you. And Hence, it is crucial that you sit behind your name tags. The interpretation is available in five languages, Estonian. I don't know how many of you, besides the Estonian delegation, uh, will use this, but there you go. English, French, Italian, and Spanish. And all relevant information that uh, is required is on placed on tables on information seats, on tables in front of you. Please read this very carefully. The conference, and also information on Wi-Fi access. Uh, the conference is streamed uh, live, 
and all so social media channels are also that are available are written on the information seat on your tables. Now, for requesting the floor for questions and comments, you can request the floor electronically from, from the seat reserved for you. When requesting the floor, uh, please use the conference unit in front of you. And again, please follow the instructions on your table. And to register for the debate, please press the head button once only on your conference unit after my announcement. The light on your microphone will then turn green. Uh, I will address you when it's your time or your turn to take the floor. And the list of all requests is displayed on the large screen uh, behind me. To start speaking, you're not required to press any buttons. So this is important. If you do press the button again, you will deregister your request. Microphones will switch on automatically. And the debate is planned to begin after my presentations, after the presentations and using a question and answer uh, form. And uh, as the, there is a potential for many people wishing to ask questions, we have uh, assigned one minute and 30 seconds, meaning 90 seconds for each interve intervention. And please be aware that we might have to reduce this to a minute should there be many requests. We will, of course, inform you on ongoing basis. And your time uh, on the large screen turns yellow to indicate the approaching end of your speaking time. And as does the moderator's bell. Um, okay, registration for comments and speeches is open from this moment onward. And we will address you uh, by your name when the question and answer session begins. Okay, we have also, it's like the who wants to be a millionaire, remember? The fastest round uh, uh, of fingers. Okay, but now to the topic, why Europe matters and Europe in the global context. We've been trying to give this conference and the, the beginning of it a bit of a sort more philosophical uh, beginning. Well, Europe compared to many, compared to other continents, especially when it comes to the population, only 500 million in the European Union uh, is not particularly large. Yet, impact on the world is considerable in terms of economy, in terms of uh, politics, in terms of um, finance capabilities, technology, perhaps defense. This is something that we will talk about in detail, uh, in, in, in depth later. Um, however, uh, and, and if we look at the e European neighborhood, its influence is far, extending far beyond the borders. And let's have the introductory remarks first by you, Madam President, and then Mr. Stubb, and we will then already continue in a more interactive form with the audience. So please, Madam President, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hannes, and I've never heard you so uh, attached to housekeeping before, but it was wonderful to hear. It is good that we are now asking why Europe matters, because um, roughly a year ago, when I became president of Estonia, Estonia and returned uh, from the European Union institutions, the question was quite often, does Europe matter? Which for me, as being a European nerd as I am, uh, was a very weird question. So I ran around uh, for a year with statistics to uh, demonstrate to people that uh, never mind your gloomy feelings, actually, statistically, Europe has delivered also all through the um, economic crisis Europe has delivered, if you look at the underlying, uh, underlying data. And um, I have to say that uh, the same also uh, appears to be true globally, because uh, if we add the military budgets, uh, personnel and assets of the EU member states, we find that um, we have the second largest military in the world. And um, we also um, provide aid to around 150 countries in the world. In 2016, EU allocated relief assistance of over 1.5 billion to 120 million people in over 80 countries. And why Europe did it? Actually, because Europe matters globally in economic sense as well. EU represents 20% of the world economy, 10% of the population, but around 30% of the world net wealth. 
even the poorest EU member state has a per capita GDP of uh, 20,000 euros. That's bigger than that of China's, which is 14,000. It's the wealthiest marketplace in the world with more than half a, bil a half a billion consumers and most of them in the middle class. The euro is the second most traded currency in the world. So how can we ask why Europe matters? It's obvious. Unless Europe would totally refuse to take the responsibility which comes with being the richest global common area with common thinking and common values, it has to matter. Mm. There's no other option. It's responsibility what we carry. Not only to make sure that our own borders are safe and that people are not coming to Europe uh, in too, too big numbers because they don't feel safe at home, etc. It's a moral obligation to matter globally. I'm grateful we have the EU global strategy and when it appeared, it was clear on principles, but um, it was heavily criticized by uh, academic um, uh, society uh, by the lack of concrete uh, policy actions and measures. Yet, I have to say it has legitimized, maybe, a more activist position of the high representative. Mm. And she has been willing to take the responsibility. Not, of course, single-handedly, but we know that the great leader in a certain area can do quite a lot. We always will have the question, principled or transactional, namely thinking of Turkey here, maybe Libya. But we have to make sure that our development aid and state building aid to states does make democratic developments in those countries stronger. Because if I may for a second revert to my previous role as an EU auditor, I've noticed in several occasions that when EU spends money, it does manage to make states stronger but it much more often fails in pushing for democratic freedoms of the people of those states. I've seen it point black in the audit reports of the European Court of Auditors. What does that mean? If we make states stronger, but fail to uh, develop democracy, we have made an oppressive state stronger with the European financing. I think we need to make sure that that never happens. I believe that Europe also matters in the um, context of uh, wider global action in, uh, in creating stability and peace. If I think of the uh, United Nations, it does matter that Europe is a big provider for the United Nations. But since we are, we also have to take responsibility of the money which gets spent there. I come from the EU institutions and I'm very used to uh, difficult organigrams and complex structures. But I tried to make sense of the UN organigram. I asked for one and I was told it's not impossible to create, it's not possible to create, it's impossible. So we have to strongly support Secretary General Guterres to make efficiency gains there. It's our money on which there will be made efficiency gains. We invest more in development cooperation than the rest of the world combined. Problem is we don't talk about it. We should be talking about it more. We have a resilience action plan, external investment plan, resilience emphasis on neighborhood policy. Elsewhere, Sahel, Northern Nigeria, Jordan, together with World Bank and United Nations, we are trying to turn to early warning and preventive action policies. We do a lot. For example, do you know what we do, say, in Colombia? Through Special Envoy, we support demining uh, uh, rural development, reintegration to society of child soldiers, etc. We do a lot, but we don't talk about it. In addition, we have many structures which appear to be dealing with exactly the same issues. For example, we have the External Action Services Crisis Response Mechanism and EU Commission Emergency Response Coordination Center. Did you know? Can you repeat the names of these organizations after me and then tell the difference between the two? And these are just two examples. There are much more. 
I think while we help, help Secretary General Guterres to sort his house through, we should also maybe consolidate our own actions as well. It's very positive what we have been doing. And sometimes we hear criticism that um, we do not do enough. We do, but it's very hard because there will always be the situation where the high representative is running around circles, the member states, to make sure that we are coherent and all agree to go in one direction. Different European institutions, as I just demonstrated, we have many. We shouldn't make her job so hard. And then, of course, also we have to work together with all other providers, particularly the United Nations and the uh, World Bank. It will never be quick and efficient, but uh, democracies are never quick and efficient. Nevertheless, we have seen during the last year, and we can read it all in the first review of the global strategy, that with the will and wish, and I have to say, with giving more leeway to run freely to high representative, we have created an impetus. Right now it has to be called a test site only because quite a lot of it relies on the personal in initiative taking of the high representative. We need to make sure that also in the future we preserve this activity. I would also like to add a few words about the defense cooperation in the European Union. It's clear that we have moved in leaps and bounds on defense. Lots of questions need to be solved. We always need to make sure that uh, the uh, different work of NATO and the EU is clearly separated, and that is clear understanding what these organizations stand for, etc. We must make sure that we each other understand each other's acronyms. It's not always the case, because both sides uh, speak in so many acronyms that it gets difficult to understand. For NATO people, for example, it is not so easy to understand where does the word SPESCO come from and what does it actually have to do with, with defense when it sounds totally alien and weird. But that aside, if I look at the um, foreign policy and defense policy cooperation, I'm wondering that sometimes on our foreign policy positions, we are less united than we are on our defense cooperation developments right now. How can that be? Totally logical. I leave you with this question. Let's think about it. Madam President, thank you very much for your initial uh, remarks. Uh, I would now like to pass the floor on to Alexander Stubb, uh, currently serving as the Vice President of the European Investment Bank. I understand it's the second week going for you, or the third. Um, but also important to mention that uh, Alexander has been a Prime Minister of Finland, also Minister, Minister of Finance, Foreign Minister and Trade and Europe uh, Minister. Alexander, did I leave anything out? As a, as a frequent flyer on Finn Air, of ah, course, I've been re reading your articles. You forgot the most important, Member of the European Parliament. There you go. <laughs> uh, but Alexander, please. Thanks, thanks, Hannes and, and um, uh, Madam President. I'll just start by saying that you, you have to understand what a great honor it is for Finn to sit here and share a stage uh, with the President of Estonia, and Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee and, and, and Defense. Uh, it's, it's a big thing. Uh, we're sort of attached by the hip with Estonia for me as a Finnish national to, to be here. It's wonderful. And we have clearly, with the President, swapped places. When she left Luxembourg and came here, uh, I ended up uh, going uh, to uh, Luxembourg. And um, I, I, I look around the stage here and I see a lot of friends. I was foreign minister with Karel Schwarzenberg and, and Urmas Paet. I've seen Tunne Kelam around. The Finnish delegation, uh, I must say, you can see how important Estonia is for Finland because we have two former foreign ministers, one former trade and Europe minister and one former prime minister uh, sitting here around as well. Maria Luis is somewhere here from Portugal. Uh, who I was finance minister with. So I, I see a lot of you and I smile because trust me, there's life after politics. It's great to be a banker. You know? And um, on that note, I, I must say that this is my first intervention uh, as a vice president of, of the European Investment Bank. And um, 
let's do it like this. If I say something which is appealing and smart, thank the European Investment Bank. If I say something, something stupid, blame me. Uh, so we'll take it, take it from them. So I'll, I'll speak here very much in a personal capacity. And before I give my three points, I, I, I do want to thank the Estonian presidency. I, I remember when I was a young civil servant, a deputy Antici, the guys that take the notes in Kurapair and, and the European councils in 1999. That was the first Finnish presidency. And it, it, was, it was a moment of immense pride. You know, and, and you can sort of sense it and feel it here in Estonia as well. Everything is well organized and done. The only thing with the presidency is that one thing should keep in mind that it's not the presidency that makes the agenda, but it's the agenda that ends up making the presidency. And sometimes you kind of want the agenda to be calm. I look at North Korea right now, I look at Syria uh, and other places, and I hope that this turns out well. So my three points today, Hannes, you asked me to be uh, academic or, or a little bit theoretical. Philosophical. Philosophical. And I, am, I, I was so happy to hear the president say that she's an EU nerd. Me too. Uh, and and I'll, I'll give three points. The first one is about dates. The second one is about implications. And the third one is about three proposals of what the EU should do so that, that we matter wor more uh, in this world of 2017. Now, the three key dates, point number one, that I would look at to try to understand the world, and this is the academic in me, are 1945, 1989, and 2016. 1945, obviously, end of World War II, the creation of the international institutions with which we live today, be it NATO, the EU, uh, the IMF, Bretton Woods, uh, etc. the beginning of a bipolar world with the Soviet Union and the United States, its allies on, on both sides. That was the world in which the European Union was created. And we seem to forget that the EU exists for four reasons. Peace, prosperity, security, and stability. And I think in 2016, it's very important to remember that. We didn't remember that in 95 or 2000 or 2010, but peace, prosperity, security, and stability, that's why we are, right? Uh, the second date, obviously, that we need to keep in mind, and especially being here in Estonia and soon celebrating the 100th independence of Estonia, uh, is 1989 and the end of uh, the Cold War. Um, I myself find my professional life to have hit a very fortunate era in the world, uh, and that was the end of the Cold War. That's when I started to study, and that for me signified that the model that we have created based on three cornerstones, a liberal democracy, social market economy, and globalization works. I'm not saying that we were without misery or, or wars in the past 25 years, but I would still argue that in terms of world history, it is probably the most prosperous, the most peaceful, and I would argue the best period that, that we have had. Uh, not only with enlargement from 12 to 15, from 15 to 25, from 25 to 27, and from 27 to 28. But we forget that. We're all sitting here as if 89 hadn't happened. But it did, and that's why we're here. Uh, then comes 2016, which I think is a third turning point in international relations, and I'll tell you in a second why. Uh, but obviously 2016 signified two major events. One of them was Brexit, uh, and the other one was uh, the US presidential elections and elections of, of, of Donald Trump. So three key dates, I think, that have been cornerstones of, of what foreign policy is and what, what Europe is, 1945, 1989, and, and then uh, 2016. My second point today is 2016, and what does it signify for Europe? Uh, I think it signifies at least three things. Number one, and I, I, I hesitate to say this, the demise of the Anglo-Saxon world. Brexit basically means voluntary marginalization of the United Kingdom, not only from uh, the European Union, but I would also argue from the world stage. I mean, if you look at the Brexiteers when it happened, it was all about Oh, look what we can do, Tr free trade agreements and bilateral agreements, and we're a great empire. And within a year, it's turned into, oh, come on, it's not that bad after all. A and I would argue that, that the UK is basically starting to understand what, what Brexit means. And the second thing is obviously the demise of, 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 of the United States, because if you build walls, 
if you're protectionist, if you put America first, if you say no to immigration, uh, and if you say strange things about NATO and globalization, it's very difficult to be a, a global leader. And for me, as someone who studied in the United States and married to a Brit and, 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 and did my education later on in the United Kingdom as well, it, it, it's a strange thing. Because the Anglo-Saxon world for me was liberal democracy, social market, econ market economy and, and globalization. Now, the second implication of all of this is, uh, I would argue, the creation of a power vacuum. And by that I mean that someone will have to fill the space that the United States had, not only during the Cold War, but after the Cold War as well. And the question is, who is going to, to, to do that? Is it going to be China on trade and globalization? Is it going to be Russia on defense and security policy? Is it going to be Europe? And if so, uh, on what? The third implication of this is, I would argue, insecurity in foreign policy and global affairs. North Korea is one example only. Uh, Syria, I would argue, uh, is a second example. Iran is a third example. And obviously, in all of this, given that we are next to Russia, Russia is a key question as, as, as well. So 2016 had significant implications. Uh, the demise of the Anglo-Saxon world, foreign policy insecurity, and the creation of a power vacuum. And now I come to my uh, final points about what uh, Europe uh, should do. I would argue that Europe should most probably do three things. The first one is to defend traditional European and Western values. There is a space for that. Someone has to take the stage and say that fundamental rights, human rights, freedom, dignity, democracy, social market economy, the respect of the other is worth fighting for. And I don't need to say this in the streets of Tallinn or Vilnius or, or Riga. We all understand why. But there's space for someone to do that. The reason being that the United States cannot anymore, I would argue, and I say this as a transatlanticist, be the leader of the free world. Much has been said about Chancellor Merkel being it, and I, I would say yes. But the rest of us Europeans must take that role as well. We must defend those wa values both in word and in action. And we all know what the difficulties we have right now with populism in various states and illiberal action in various European states, be it in governments or in opposition, we've seen. Uh, the second thing I think Europe should do is to take a strong role uh, on trade. And I, I think we're doing that quite well uh, at the moment by forging bilateral trade agreements, uh, be it with uh, Japan uh, or Korea or working on one with India, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I still have my hopes up for TTIP, uh, but whether that'll take place or, or not. But we need to defend uh, free trade. That is part of, of uh, globalization. And the third thing I think we need to do um, and I guess I say this as, as, as someone coming uh, from, a, from a country which is, uh, and I, I, I say this uh, from the bottom of my heart, unfortunately not a member of NATO. Uh, I think uh, we should really focus on European security uh, and defense. Uh, just like the president said, it doesn't have to be uh, on top of the other. It can be uh, complementary. And there, I think the papers that have been put forward by, for instance, the European Commission on either cooperating or sharing or a common foreign security and defense policy, I think are definitely worth uh, looking at. Because if we are in a situation whereby the United States is slowly taking itself or having taken distance from Europe, we also need to work on things together. So ladies and gentlemen, these are my two cents worth in, 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 in 10 minutes. First, the three key dates, 45, 89, and, and 16. And secondly, uh, the ramifications of it, which is the demise of an Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, world uh, insecurity uh, in uh, world affairs.
uh, and then the emergence of a power vacuum to what Europe should do. Focus on values, focus on trade, and focus on defense. Aite, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. If I may, before that, to open the floor for uh, our distinguished guests and colleagues, uh, let me just put up one question about uh, the kind of uh, interesting trend what we see today in Europe. When we ask our citizens, and as I mentioned, uh, are we sure in which direction Europe goes? In many ways, does Europe matter for our citizens? And then we get answers specifically and actually in uh, founding members of, uh, among founding members of European Union that people are not sure. But at the same time, specifically what happened after Brexit, people are more lean to stay in. Um, so it's a question, is it, that shows insecurity uh, of the world we have today, or it shows also that uh, we don't have, we as politicians have given enough good answers uh, to solve those problems which creates insecurity among uh, our citizens. What do you think? Indeed, Marco. Um, I have to say that uh, we've always said that we uh, present and project the European values, which goes without saying even, I would say. But nowadays we do present and project also predictability. Without naming and shaming quite to the level which, uh, which Alexander chose, uh, I do agree that the world is quite unpredictable around us. And therefore, indeed, uh, making things in a predictable way, this is what our citizens hope from Europe. Predictable doesn't mean slow and plan 30 years ahead. Planning 30 years ahead is a ridiculous thought in 21st century. Things are moving kaleidoscopically. Mm. But precisely to sticking uh, to these simple principles of our values, we can be predictable to our people, and this is what our people expect. We badly need to be more open and talk more about it. It's, it's horrible if you go around the conferences and seminars and hear all the whining going on about how badly Europe uh, is, is actually performing. It is not at all. Take the Europe out of the equation and, and see where you would be sure. with the global order. In a much worse place. Where we have room to uh, develop, actually, is that uh, Alexander mentioned our, our trade policy as a capacity to also uh, spread our values and, um, and uh, help the rest of the world. We have a big problem in matching up our trade stream with our development aid stream, with our foreign policy stream. And there, I believe, uh, you here around uh, this room have a, have a great role to make sure that we create tools by which we can actually bring uh, these streams together. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, I, I, I fully agree with the president. Just two quick points on that. Uh, the first one is one of the big problems we have in Europe is, is the blame game. US politicians know, know how it goes. You know, a lot of European politicians, and, and you know, me in my former life as well, what you do is you end up blaming Brussels. So everything that is bad comes from Brussels, and everything that is good is thanks to me. Uh, and you know where I'm coming from on this. And, and, and when you keep on giving that message that Brussels sucks or Europe sucks, when you fully are aware that, as a matter of fact, you're just trying to find common solutions to common problems, then that message starts hitting home. And the toughest way in which it hits home, if you hammer down that message for 40 years, is Brexit. And then suddenly you notice, whoops, it's a little bit too late. We can't stop the procedure uh, anymore. So I, I think you know, we have to be careful with that blame game. My second point is, funnily enough, and I should have probably said this in my introduction, from a pro-European perspective, Brexit and Trump were probably the best things that could have happened. Because now, in 27 capitals, people start to understand what happens if you push the bucket. And suddenly people notice that, whoops, okay, you know, we can't take it this far. There is obviously an argument, and I say this again as an academic in a personal capacity, what if the US elections had been before the Brexit vote? Mm. What do you think the Brexit vote would have been? I would argue it would have probably been, been the opposite. Uh, and right now, all of us who are international liberals, pro-Europeans, we breathe a sigh of relief. But for how long? I, I, I really don't know. And here's where we come to exactly what the president said, that the, Europe needs to get its act together. It needs to produce results. 
Um, if it doesn't do so, uh, you know, the blame game is going to go on, and we're going to see more populist, anti-liberal uh, movements uh, emerging. Uh, I would like to use my privilege as a moderator also to uh, ask a question before we pass the floor to the seven requested um, uh, speakers no, or, or um, uh, speaking requests. Um, you painted a, a, an optimistic view, I think, We're talking about the challenges too about, about Europe. <coughs> and I'm glad that you did. Uh, however, um, one could also argue that um, the glory days of Europe, and I'd like to provoke you on that, in a way are over. I mean, if you look at the European population, 500 million versus, I mean, just south of the Mediterranean, a continent of 1.2 billion today, uh, predicted to grow to 2.4 billion by 2050 and to 4.2 billion by the turn of the century. This will create a different si uh, situation completely when we talk about the relevance of Europe. Um, and also, if, if we look at the sort of economic and po possibly also the security gravity of the world, it's clearly shifting to the Asia-Pacific region. Um, many of the world's biggest and fastest growing, very dynamic economies are there uh, today. So in, gi given this, uh, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you place Europe in a, pla uh, in a position looking well into the future? where we continue to matter and to be relevant. Mm. Well, there was, do you remember, I think Paul Kennedy wrote a book called The Rise and Fall of, of Great Empires. And I've, I've, you know, I'm thinking out loud here. Um, if you think of the European Union as some kind of an empire, which basically holds in it former empires, the United Kingdom, um, France, for instance, Spain, uh, to a certain extent, uh, there is usually a fairly natural cycle of uh, different uh, centuries that you have of dominance. And obviously, post-World War II, one could argue that, that Europe did dominate together with the United States. And I, I think we need to get used to the fact, for demographic and other reasons, that there will be an emergence of the rest. Uh, obviously, in 2000 plus, there was a lot of talk about the BRICS. Uh, now there's been a lot of talk about Asia proper, uh, about China. Uh, and in many ways, it is, it is a competition between nations. My argument is that if the EU wants to survive, or if the nation states that uh, are the building blocks of the EU want to survive, the only way in which you can do it is, as like the speaker said, is integrate, integrate, uh, and integrate. And sometimes it is a little bit uncomfortable because it's about pooling and sharing sovereignty. Uh, but I would, for instance, argue that the internal market, it's four freedoms, is integration and the basis of our welfare state. If we didn't have the four freedoms, we would not be able to have social security at home. Uh, the euro has been the beacon uh, of uh, safety and stability as a currency, even throughout the financial crisis. So Europe has to integrate, and it has to modernize, and it has to realize that the rest of the world is catching up, and that is just uh, a reality of, of demographics. If I take uh, on from here, then indeed, you say rightly that uh, Europe is uh, half a billion, but it's 30% of the global GDP. Yeah. A totally different number, I have to say. If we think of the uh, areas elsewhere, then uh, may I remind you that Millennium Goals have actually been fulfilled. And I don't think just because they were written out on a little blue piece of paper and posted on all our seats on IMF annual meeting in 98 or something, but simply because the uh, economic development and technological development has reached um, global population. So we are not to be the nanny of the world. We are to be the driver for development, but not the nanny of the world. We have to take the responsibility to drive. But for that, indeed, we need ourselves to be actually really strong economically and also uh, showing to the world that we can grapple with the technological change, for example, for our people. Indeed, Brussels has been blamed quite often and quite a lot uh, 
and it has been always blamed for the uh, for the fact that it is not able to make sure that everybody is um, getting the benefits from the integration which we have created at the EU level, which is a totally wrong tree to bark under, because all redistributional action, all, I repeat, in a wide sense, starting from education and uh, healthcare, is member states' responsibility. We need to be clear in saying that, and honest in saying that, and honest also in facing up to the uh, errors which we have made in this communication, not only from member states who have been blaming, but also from the uh, institutions who have been claiming. I remember many reports how many jobs exactly European Union programs have created in member states. Yeah. Sorry, it was the member states' governments who created those jobs. Yes, making use of the uh, leverage European Union integration gives us. Yeah. So both sides actually are to blame and we need to get out of the blaming game and actually start to adapt to 21st century, including technology. We are sitting in Tallinn and the Digital Summit is coming up. I have to say I'm very astonished how uh, adverse is European general reaction to the technology development. We are lucky that it's not only European. I also heard in uh, Brussels conference American politicians uh, talk about uh, taxing artificial intelligence and, uh, and paying uh, universal uh, uh, salaries to everybody. Um, I'm always asking myself, look, 100 years ago, if we had taxed tractors and we had paid subsistence fees to agricultural workers who lost their jobs, would industrialization even have happened and how long it would have taken? Yes, it's true that uh, simple people suffered heavily through industrial transformation but it is because we didn't have the social model at that time. Now we have social and educational model to help people to adapt to new technologies. And this model needs to work Europe-wise, I agree. But still, member states carry the responsibility for redistribution. Let's keep that distinction clear. If we start blurring that line, we will always fail because we will overpromise. We will overreach and overpromise. We cannot do that. What to do then to help our people to cope with tech world? As I said, education. But first we should make sure that our governments have not left our people alone with technology, which currently is clearly the state of affairs. It's so visible. People are in the internet, businesses are in the internet, using technology globally. We have failed to take down walls between member states, even European member states, on trade, and services through technology. Worse, there is only a handful of countries who provide their people nowadays in internet with the secure ability to identify each other to each other and securely therefore do the deals. The majority of the European citizens have to rely on those global tech behemoths which many of us so despise for identification reasons because governments are not helping them. It's not a choice, it's inevitable that we need to go there, be present in the cyber world with our people, develop our cyber hygiene, make our people feel safe, because as we can see, technology creates jobs. These jobs which we are worried are not being created when industrial jobs are leaving us. And these jobs are not in high tech. These jobs are very simple jobs, actually, which are enhanced by the existence of internet. Simple handicraft people can now sell globally. 200 years ago, they could only sell lo on local market. Bookkeepers can work in five countries at the same time, if they so wish. We need to encourage them. We need to enhance their capacity. And then we need to think about our social systems to uh, uh, sustain, be sustained in 21st century. Because right now we have the industrial model-based social systems. They will disappear. The tax river is not going to flow in anymore from big factories. Yesterday, uh, there was a debate uh, under our council presidency about taxing in the future. We need quickly to solve all those issues, to be first strong ourselves, remain strong ourselves, believe in ourselves, and then predict this self-confidence to the surrounding areas. One last word. Um, if I think about the Eastern Partnership and European Neighbourhood Policy, I have a feeling that um, for a number of years now, 
since we do not offer enlargement perspective and we do not offer a clear signal that there is an intermediate way, not being a member but being close to Europe as something which people could look forward to, we have put all the Eastern Partnership on ice. Yes, we do have little steps and, and try to provide uh, concrete results like visa-free travel, etc. But I think we should actually define what will become of Eastern Partners. It's not that they all even maybe want to become European Union members one day. They might not want to. Same for Southern Partners, obviously. But we need to define a status to which they could aim based on our values. This way we could help these countries without, without overreaching, but also honestly facing up to the fact that we cannot make everybody to join European Union in order to make world globally stable. Thank you, uh, President. I uh, now turn to our colleagues. Uh, and uh, while we have now roughly 30 minutes left uh, for our debates, uh, I kindly ask you to, to be precise in your questions. And uh, we have limited to one minute. Uh, and first, I give a floor to uh, Mr. Eugen Freund from European Parliament, please. Thank you very much. First, let me say that I'm very pleased to see a woman president here in Estonia. It is always baffling to me that with roughly half the population being women in the world, so few play important roles in political or economic affairs. So exceptions are always very welcome. Does Europe matter? I think we shouldn't even phrase the question this way. Europe matters, exclamation mark. But we must be sure that our 500 million people with our economic power have a voice in international affairs. Federica Mogherini does her best to do so. But the present crisis around the North Korean issue makes it more clear than ever that Europe must urgently insert itself diplomatically to resolve this crisis, particularly at the time when we have a president in the United States who is, to put it mildly, as unpredictable as his counterpart in North Korea. Thank you. Uh, this was a comment, uh, more uh, rather than a question. Uh, the next one uh, I'm passing the floor to is uh, Mr. Urmas Pat from the European Parliament. Please. Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, I'm confident that Europe is already global leader in, in many issues. Uh, we lack uh, sometimes self-confidence, and of course there is clear lack of uh, European defence and security cooperation. And I think that this cannot be only on the voluntary basis, defence and security cooperation. I am European Parliament's rapporteur on European Defence Union, and for me it is clear that this is one of the elements which was and still is missing for Europe. Uh, of course, we have to develop it hand in hand with NATO. Unfortunately, being soft power is not enough if we really want to contribute to security and peace in Europe, but also in the world. So that I was glad to see that also ministers of defense here in Thailand yesterday made another steps uh, to move forward. And question. Ms. President, Alex Stoop, what do you think? Should EU Defense Union be only on the voluntary basis, or where should be the balance point? Please, the floor is yours. I think it is good to start on a voluntary basis and get PESCO started, get it defined, get the clear um, um, uh, characteristics decided on which you can even join PESCO. There is a payoff. If you make it obligatory, you cannot set the high thresholds which currently are planned at 2 and 20. If you make it voluntary and make uh, the thresholds to enter and join, relatively high, you might make it a club which countries want to join. But you have a point. I've seen, actually, it was a colleague of mine who said that, do you really spend 2% of the GDP on defense? I said, yes, so we spend 2.17. And he was, oh my god, I didn't know. We spend 0 0.9. We have been free riding on you. So you have a point, Ormas. 
Alexander, do you uh, wish to uh, add Yeah, in, in my capacity as uh, Vice President of the EIB, I have a very strong opinion on this. No, um, Urmas, I, you know, I, I, I think the, the, the big answer is, I think it's in the nature of European integration that integration in one area leads to pressure to integrate in another one. And I think that the next step in European integration is defense union. Uh, whether it's voluntary uh, or mandatory, it is difficult to say at this stage. But we have basically moved from a foreign policy union to a security union, and the next step is, is, is defense. The Amsterdam Treaty brought in crisis management. The Lisbon Treaty uh, brought in the defense aspect, I recall, in Articles 22 and, and, and 44. Um, from the EIB perspective, if I may, um, it is something that we are looking at right now in terms of uh, investment because we have been asked by the European Council to take action uh, mainly in the defense industry or in the industry of uh, dual goods. So that is one small element of this package. Um, having said that, and in the big picture, I don't think it should be mandatory. I think it should be voluntary but it will probably be so appealing that everyone will, at the end of the day, want to join. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Mrs. Anja Gomes from European Parliament, please. Uh, I'm also a European nerd, uh, and longer than you because I'm much older. Um, from does European, does EU matter to why it matters, the challenge is how to make it matter globally. Mm -hmm. And of course, that requires, indeed, EU investment in defense. And my question is, doesn't it also require a reform of the UN Security Council? And isn't Brexit an opportunity to, indeed, put the EU at the seat of the Security Council? And then, uh, because it's, it's not just about fair, free trade, it's about fair trade because it has links with redistribution. It's a question of taxation. Shouldn't the EU lead in the digital area to indeed not allow taxation in the EU at the, glo and at the global level to indeed be a conduit for uh, financing terrorism and organized crime? Dear panelists, please, would please. Like Should I take the economic one, you take the political one? Okay. On the taxation side, I'm um, sure you're aware and you follow very closely BEPS from the OECD. Uh, I think the aftermath of the Panama Papers uh, and a lot of cooperation is being done in that field. And I, I do agree with you, given that there is pretty much, obviously, free movement uh, of money and capital around the world. And there is going to be a lot of tax competition. We need to start working on this inside the European Union. Uh, and uh, globally as well. And this is an issue of fairness. Um, can I link Brexit to this question as well? It'll be very interesting to see um, what kind of a future relationship the EU will have with the United Kingdom. And one of the things that the EU 27, who've been remarkably unified so far, will be looking at is not to give the United Kingdom a competitive advantage, whether in social dumping, taxation, uh, or, for instance, in environmental dumping. So this is something that we'll have to have a close look at. But on the seat in the UN Security Council, I hand it over to the President. I am in strong favor of, uh, of clear representation of the European Union at the international bodies. So it is my own clear view that there would be uh, a need to put up a fight when we see the reform of the United Nations to also make sure that EU has space in that organization as a common body. But I know that uh, not all member states obviously share that ambition. About taxation, I would, I would like to refer to what I already said. We need to globally rethink how we tax anyway, and we also need to globally rethink how we provide services because uh, our people are global as well. People need nothing else than a safe hub to provide them with their educational, healthcare and social needs, but they want to move globally. We have a competitive advantage as Europeans because we have already some understanding of how uh, social services can be portable, pensions, uh, healthcare, we move around the member states. But this only makes us to understand the complexity of the problem. So indeed, we need to use also not only EU, but also OECD 
in order to rethink globally taxation? Now, the next question is to our Latvian colleague, Lolita Tsigana. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Chair. I would like to first make uh, one uh, observation that actually uh, to the question that uh, Mr. Stubb asked when the EU uh, will start delivering, uh, President Kaljulain responded very well, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the president uh, responded very well. The president said that the EU is obviously already delivering. And if we look around the streets uh, of Tallinn, we obviously see that. And uh, we just have to be flexible and see how to deliver even better in the globally changing world. And in this respect, I believe that the notion that we really have to take the ownership of the EU's successes, no matter how young, uh, or small member countries we are is very, very important. But how do we tell this to our citizens who probably do not always feel that they've been part of this development, that they've benefited from the integration? That is my question. Thank you. Can I now do my elevator talk for the European Investment Bank? Because <laughs> this is probably the best kept secret in the European Union. And I'm an EU nerd as Anna and as the president and I didn't know how much good the EIB does. Now, when you fly from here, you will go through an airport which has been funded by the EIB. When you fly to your own airport, you will go to an airport which has been funded and financed by the EIB. You will probably take a train which has been funded by the EIB, pass a factory which has been funded by the EIB. Here are the figures. The EIB is owned by its 28 member states. The total capital of the bank, approximately 600 billion euros. This is with the seed money of 14 billion. Think about the leverage. It gives loans annually worth 80 billion euros. These are cheap loans to SMEs, infrastructure, innovation, and climate environment. 650 projects. This is good money. It doesn't do fiscal stuff. It doesn't legislate. It gives jobs and growth and feeds the real economy. Please tell this story to youngsters and others. The EIB is the EU's good back. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. You have done your bit. <laughs> I have my own pitch, which I always make on these occasions as well. As I already said, uh, delivering to simple people is, uh, is the member states' governmental responsibility. Uh, and I think we should make it very clear that this is exactly how it is. And uh, honestly, to put this responsibility clearly back to where it belongs. If I look at the EU budget, and here comes my really boring speech from 2006, Schoer Committee to the European Parliament, Schoer Committee before the well, current uh, financial perspective discussion started. There is lots of errors against the principle of subsidiarity in the European Union budget. If we remedy those errors, we will have lots of money to deliver on solidarity. And here I mean development aid, uh, refugee support, uh, etc. We have lots of policies which totally lack the uh, cross-border component. Wherever you look, I'm sorry to say so, rural development, cohesion. There is one good uh, example of the policy, which is the science, science policy Horizon 2020 or framework programs before, which is geographically neutral, truly merit-based and available to the best scientists uh, in Europe. There is a good facility of connecting Europe, which is a cross-border by its nature. In everything else, I'm sorry to say, there are lots of things which member states should actually do themselves, and it would be much cheaper to Europe globally. And we would make room in the budget without rising the budgetary ceilings to our global mm. action on foreign policy and maybe also on defense policy. Yeah. Can I on the budget, just one point? I mean, just think about just it. Just one. What is your national budget? In Finland, it's about 55 billion. The EIB is 80 billion of loans, market-based. The EU budget is about 125 to 150 billion. So that's where you see, and that's not direct money subsidies, it's a loan which is leveraged. Very good, our discussion is uh, so interesting. We have 10 more requests at the moment. I ask uh, to close the list right now. We have a uh, few minutes left, and I ask also our honorable speakers to be precise uh, answering questions. Now, Mr. Ben Knappen from Netherlands. 
Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's quite exciting to be uh, here in Tallinn and to have so much a sense of a global outlook on international affairs. It's, it, it, it's highly uh, stimulating and I, uh, rec I commend the President for that. I have a, a question to both of you. Um, when it comes to foreign policy and uh, the international arena. Uh, the DNA of the European Union is one of multilateralism, of soft power, of a rules-based community. Now, the world requires uh, a more geopolitical, power-based policy. My question, because uh, Alex was referring to, 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 to Kennedy and the, the rise and fall of powers, uh, where he said we have more a competition between nations. Now, my question is, can an institution like the EU behave like a state? Is that doable with 27 member states? Thank you. Thank you, and if I may, to sum uh, up uh, two more questions uh, from uh, Mr. Paolo Pisco from uh, Portugal, please. <coughs> Thank you, President. Um, I guess the question why Europe matters is really the question, and it's our responsibility to keep it uh, um, alive. But my question is, as Europe, um, after the big crisis of 2008 and uh, all the difficulties that Europe had to managing the crisis and all the subsequent crises, that put in question even the continuity of European Union. And uh, now, after the and that as the consequence, the the dramatic uh, leave of uh, United Kingdom from uh, European Union. And after now we are uh, breathing uh, in a moment of relief, but uh, mm, we can now think about the lessons that we can take, and that is my question. Uh, after all this crisis, after all this uh, disbelief about the continuity of European Union, which lessons could we take from uh, the crisis that we had? What European Union will do differently from the past? Thank you, and uh, also Mr. Edward Zamitli. Uh, from Malta, please. So, well, thank you for your eloquent and, and clear contributions. Uh, one, just one point about our con our communication strategies on a national and EU level. I believe that why Europe matters. It's uh, there are evident advantages, and maybe we have to explain more to our citizens the opportunity cost of not having. Uh, an integrated Europe. So I believe that Europe should be a, a global player, yes, but uh, our main challenge at the moment is to explain it more to our citizens. Uh, Mr. Stubb mentioned the European Investment Bank. Malta just negotiated uh, a loan for a housing project. We are negotiating a school for hospitality and tourism with, with the European Investment Bank. However, how many of our citizens know the role of the European Investment Bank, the budget and its function? So there is a lot to do with our citizens in de developing communication strategies on a national level, but again in a coordinated manner. Thank you very much. And uh, the last one in this group, I ask uh, Mr. Konrad Kumembowski from Poland, please. Madam President, uh, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, let me thank our Estonian uh, colleagues for pr very good preparations and organization of this meeting. Uh, it is hard to agree with uh, Mr. Alexander Stubb that uh, USA is not more uh, the leader. Uh, I think that uh, for many years USA will be the leader. 36% of global spending on defense uh, comes from uh, USA. Mm, and uh, the facts uh, count. The facts are that under the administration of Donald Trump, uh, the eastern flank of NATO uh, is uh, enforced uh, and even uh, more. So the question is, uh, if uh, you think that don't you think that th it is in the interest of Russia that the transatlantic ties are weakened? Thank you. Thank you, and speakers, if you could be short in answers to, to our colleagues. First question, can Europe act as a state? 
yes, it can, on free conditions. First, we rely on our values and principles, which we do quite well. Second, we speak in one voice, which we sometimes do quite well. And third, we actually trust the institutions on tactical solutions and issues, which we do really, really bad. There is the biggest bottleneck, I find. The crisis which Europe has faced and whether we have the reason to believe that we can weather them. Actually, if you look what happened during the, let's say, economic crisis or financial crisis, we came out with a stronger, stronger structured euro area. So we didn't withdraw, we didn't say sorry, we, we over-integrated and withdraw. We actually developed what we had and the same is now happening to Schengen. We are making Schengen stronger by adding the technically obvious, uh, well, facilities which we couldn't before because our people did not ask for them and now we can do it. So we can demonstrate that through crisis, European Union always has developed even with the last ones. It's not nice process, but it does happen. On communication, you are sitting in a country indeed where 26 years of uh, permanent and uh, united messaging that European Union is good, yields results. There are other countries in European Union who receive the same uh, well development and sup uh, development aid and support as we have received for this 26-year period, where Europe is not uniformly loved. Here in Estonia, it is the case because our governments have never said that Europe is to blame. We accept our blames ourselves. We blame each other well, really, really well. I have to say, inside the country, that about communication. About Russia, of course it's in Russia's interest if uh, the Western value-based uh, uh, security architecture crumbles. So we have to withstand, and Europe has been withstanding quite well, uh, both on foreign policy and, uh, and also in developing our defense policy, I believe we stand uh, against that push. Quickly, answer number one on crisis. I think the EU deals with crisis in three stages. Number one is the crisis itself, be it asylum or the euro. Number two is chaos, and usually that chaos is total. And number three is a suboptimal solution. That's how the crises go, and that's how we survive. And I think the euro crisis is a good example of that, the asylum crisis is. That's the lesson that we learn. Let's not expect easy solutions. Let's not expect perfect uh, solutions. On communication, um, I agree with you, we need to do it better, but at the same time, the EU is not only a communications exercise. We have to talk good things, we have to talk bad things, we have to explain in simple terms, but at the end of the day, all of these people who say we need to bring the EU closer to its people, I think that's rubbish. The EU should be as far away from the people as possible and just do its job. That's, I think, what the EU uh, is best at. Uh, final point. Uh, to Conrad from the same in, in Poland, I disagree with you fundamentally on this. And the reason is that you cannot measure global leadership purely on military expenditure. I am fully aware that the United States is, what, tenfold of Russian military expenditure, double the size of the EU together. But global, global leadership is also, I would argue, about respect Global leadership is about action, and global leadership is about consistency and diplomacy. Global leadership is based on the idea that you take a role in the world. But if the President of the United States has said that the United States should not take that lead anymore, then I think that is a clear message. On Russia, uh, I fully agree. This is. One of the key strategies of Russia is actually to create disunity among Western states and also among, uh, uh, among the European Union. Uh, yes, there has been a commitment in terms of expenditure to NATO, but certainly if you look at the language of the president on two specific occasions uh, on NATO, I wouldn't exactly say that it has been the most pro-NATO uh, line that has been taken. So I think, unfortunately, I say this as a strong transatlanticist. Everyone who knows me, so I mean, I want the U.S. to be the world leader, but right now it is not, and in the future it will not be unless it starts changing its policies. Uh, thank you. As we have six speaking requests left, I am afraid we need to cut the intervention time or the question time to 30 seconds, and I'll pull it all together. So, without any further... Uh, do please, Mr. Pierre Alexander, 
I'm glad, and then in the uh, current order. Be very brief, please. Wave where you yes. Are. yes, well, thank you very much. Uh, let me first of all uh, tell you that we are very happy to be here today, the French delegation. We've got a, a new parliament and a new administration, and it's for us a, an important moment to be here with you. My question will, will be very, very short. Uh, Mr. Stubb, you say that there were three key dates for you. For me, I see another key date. It's 2005, when the French people said, and the Netherlands say no to the EU constitution. You say that the uh, the link with the between the European institution and the people is in your point of view not the, the main thing I think it's different we need to recreate the link so I'd like to to know what's your perspective on that thank you please the next speaker our good Hungarian friend Zlot Nemeth uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, uh, I do agree uh, that uh, Estonia is the best example why Europe matters. Uh, we are here now in the former Soviet Union, and Tallinn and Estonia demonstrates why Europe matters. So thank you very much for the professional organization, and it's great to be here with you. Uh, I agree with uh, Alexander that 2016 was a very important date. But I would not also uh, formulate that, that this is the end of the Anglo-Saxon world, the demise of the Anglo-Saxon world. I think we shouldn't say things like this. Uh, I agree with my, my uh, Polish colleague that the real question what you said, can we reformulate the transatlantic cooperation between Europe and the United States? That is the real question. Uh, and uh, one more... I all the com uh, com compliments uh, to Estonia. Your time is up. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Please, and uh, uh, Mrs. Reiter, next. From Austria. Thank you very much. I just would like to make a short comment, uh, since it was allowed to also have philosophical ideas in this discussion. Uh, Mr. Stubb said uh, that 2016 created um, a power vacuum, and he said there is the necessity to that somebody has to fill it. And I think this is a dangerous thought, because um, uh, if we do not overcome this idea that somebody has to fill a power vacuum, uh, we are going going to lose globally. And the EU has done the opposite since 1945, uh, trying to solve this question of a power vacuum differently with institutions. And this is why Europe matters. And if it can globally uh, transfer this model of how to fill a power vacuum, then Europe will be successful and we will be successful globally. Thank you. Next one up, the Finnish. Participant, Mr. Uh, Salolainen. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, I have so little time that's difficult to say all I wanted to say. But one thing I want to take up is that there is one unsolved, very critical problem in Europe now, and that is the refugee issue. We haven't taken it uh, as seriously as it should have been. Uh, there are millions probably coming from Africa and other places. How are we going to solve this problem in, with the solidarity uh, sort of, that we need to solve this uh, enormous crisis? Because it's creating difficulties also internally in our countries, as, as we have seen. A very relevant question indeed. And the last one, please, Mr. Carlos Troyes from Spain. Thank you very much. Environment uh, protection, energy consumption, food safety and control, and Erasmus program allow and study in other member states. Europe matter, of course, but sometimes we go slow, don't you think? We talk about security. 20 member states agree on details of creating the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Don't you think we go slow in this matter and we have to move faster? Thank you very much. Thank you, and um, as we are already well into a coffee break, a few minutes into a coffee break, please, I know it's an impossible task, but try your best to keep your answers. Sir? Final comments, very short. Okay, uh, I'll go uh, very quickly. Monsieur Anglad, 2005 French referendum, yes, a big moment for Europe, uh, institutional crisis. Um, the link between citizens and Europe. I would quote the president here and say that we should not 
overestimate our case. The EU budget is 1% of GDP of the whole area. National budgets are between 20 and 40% of GDP. The redistributive values, social policies, employment policies, they are funded and financed by your state, not by the European Union. That's why I think there should be a clear uh, distance. Uh, I was interested to see the slight marriage here between Poland and Hungary. Uh, on the transatlantic relationship, and I fully respect that. I think it should be renewed as well. All I'm trying to say is that it is quite difficult to do right now. Europe loved Obama, so the same cannot be said for Donald Trump. I hope I'm wrong on this. I, I really do sincerely, because I'm the one who wants to have very close relations. Uh, Mrs. Reiter, power vacuum, could the institutions fill it? That's what I want. You know, I, I believe in multilateralism. I believe in the European Union. I believe in institutions. And that's why I believe that Europe should take a leading uh, role on this, and I agree. Uh, final point, uh, Perti Salalainen from Finland on refugees. Again, as difficult as this crisis has been, there are only common solutions to common problems. We need to have quotas, we need to share the burden, and that's, for instance, why I welcome the latest opinion of the European Court of Justice that the Commission was right in setting up a system whereby there is burden sharing. I would start from the refugee question. I think the key issue to keep our people's support on solving the refugee issue is that we give assurance to our people that the European culture, which has evolved, through hundreds of years, through centuries, and this involvement has not always been present. But it, it has come to a situation where we respect individual rights, where we respect rights of women and children, where we respect that human life is sacred. And this has to be told to our people that we will do everything what is necessary, that these principles we hold in the whole European Union, be it on the streets, in some uh, schools, in some suburbs, in countries which have many, uh, many people coming from elsewhere. We need to make sure that our European culture, where our people feel comfortable to live, prevails. On EU linked to people, I think it's quite clear we share the position here that the uh, European Union is a difficult technical construct which allows member states to cooperate. And this is what exactly what we should tell our people. I know it's in unpopular in European Parliament. Sorry about that. About power vacuum, I would agree that we have a role to fill the vacuum, but I wouldn't call it power, I call it leadership. Mm. Uh, thank you very much for our panelists, and of course, thank you for the very active participation. It was like a running 100-meter sprint at the end, but th that is life. A uh, big round of applause for our speakers, and we will see you all at quarter past 11. We have 22 minutes for our coffee break.